Wherever you are, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your Bible and your word that you've given us. You preserved this throughout the centuries, Lord. Uh, Nothing has been able to hold this book back, and especially the truth in it and your love. And so, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be not only present here on our campus at St. John, but in every home and heart of those that are watching with us. And so, God, we pray that you would take all distractions away, Lord, even the uh, noises in the house. Just, uh, Lord, just move all those away so that we can just really focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Boy, it is so good to be with you today. I had one of our band members say a while ago, he says, wow, this is the largest group of people I've been around of people I don't know. Right, you go to the grocery store and there's a lot of people, but to be here and just have a few, it's like, wow. And I really feel that I'm with hundreds of you right now and you're with me. Uh, We are with the Lord Jesus. We're going to spend some time in his word. If you're uh, with us for the first time, we're in the middle of a sermon series called uh, Love is a Verb Too. And today we're going to be talking specifically about the idea that love accepts Love accepts. And to kind of get into that, we're going to kind of like back into that with another topic that was just uh, in part of the scripture reading about the idea of judging. So uh, we're going to talk about judging. What is that? How does that fit into our lives? Should it fit into our lives? Uh, Are we appropriately able to judge people? Should we judge people? Do we judge ourselves? And then back into the idea of what it means uh, in, in, in like tangently with that to lovingly accept somebody. So a lot to unpack today. If you want to follow along in your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, the first five, five verses that Joel just read there. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Romans chapter 5, some in 1 Peter. So you're going to be all over the place, but uh, just go ahead and follow along and just let the Spirit speak to you and kind of do that surgery on your heart that is needed right now. I just want to address uh, the elephant in the room. You know, these are kind of uh, anxiety-filled times. These are times that are filled with a lot of fear. I heard on the news yesterday that the, uh, the mental health experts are telling us that whatever index they use to measure how anxiety-ridden and nervous and busy people are at Christmas uh, and Thanksgiving with all the preparations and the people that are coming over, well, our current time eclipses that by a ton. The level is off the charts And people are acting out and and thinking in so many different ways. And you're probably feeling some of that stress too. Maybe you have the stress of what happens if uh, I don't have my job and it doesn't come back and they maybe relocate things. What happens if I get sick or I am sick or my family's sick and I have uh, people that, that have low immunity in my family? What if I bring it in and the guilt and the factor? I mean, there's all sorts. We could just go on forever. We're not going to be able to cover all that today, but if you um, are on Facebook or Instagram and you want to check it out, uh, we are doing a daily, like one minute, encouragement from the pastors. And so Pastor John, Jet, myself, we're doing that. So check that out. We're going to put those on around noon every day so you can get that daily word of encouragement that's pertinent for the daily life that you're walking right now. So today, kind of that anxiety and fear, it, it, it pops up in a few ways in our lives. And sometimes it pops up in the idea that we feel like we're losing control. You feel like that? You're like, well, I just got to do what the government says. I can't really do that or that. I'm losing control. I don't know if I'll get sick or not. And a lot of times the loss of control will cause us to act out. And one of the ways it causes us to act out is by judging. Usually you look out at the world and you start to judge things because you feel that's the control I have, right? Right? Um, I can look out and, and make decisions upon people or events or situations. That's the control I still have. How many of you looked out your window and you're like, look at that. That neighbor, they're closer than six feet to the other neighbor. What are they doing? You get all upset with them and everything. You're like, my goodness, just chill out. But we go there sometimes. Here's an example for me. The idea of trying to control things and judging uh, Now that we're home, we're both working from home and just tons of phone calls, emails, texts, praying with people, you name it. Uh, My wife is is a high school counselor, and so she also works from home. It's super cool. I wish I had a picture of it right here, but the table's all set with uh, all of her books for the different binders and stuff, and you know, I mean, she's just working her tail off, but, but now and then we get little breaks where we're like, hey, do you have a Zoom meeting now? Or do you? No, we don't. So uh, then we have maybe lunch together, or sometimes we can take a little 20-minute walk together. Well, when we walk in the neighborhood, you know, the street's only so wide, and sometimes you have two cars come in, so I like to walk next to my wife. Usually when you're walking with somebody, you walk next to them. Well, when a car is coming, of course, as the gentleman, I go ahead and get behind her. 
and allow her to get hit first. No, I, no, I go behind her because I'm a, a good male husband taking care of Let her walk in front of me, right? So I wonder if she's still watching right now. Anyway, uh, so that, that's what happens. And, and here's what usually happens. The only time I do that, right, is when a car is passing. And one of two things happen inevitably. A car goes real slow, like, oh, I don't want to make sure I hit them. I get way over, you know, and they're going like six miles an hour. And I'm like, I wish they would just hurry up. Come on. I want to get back next to my wife. And I start judging them, right? Get upset. They're actually being kind. They're like being lovingly loving to us. They're not wanting to hit us. That's a good thing. And then on the other end, this is what happens too. I'm not going to give what kind of cars these look like or what age of people are driving them, but usually they're like these little uh, fast, you name it. And these, they'll just come straight barreling down 40 miles an hour in our neighborhood right next to us. And I'm like, what you thinking? You know, I'm I'm like, I'm a pastor. I'm always a pastor, you know, but you look at them and you want to say. And it's interesting that sometimes you just judge, judge, judge. They're going slow. They're going fast. My reaction get some control and judge them. Now that's a small little thing, but think about that in other parts of our lives. When you're listening to the news, listening to people trying to do the best they can with a system that is not put in place to deal with something like this, and we think out and we project and we judge. So what do we do with that? Because it doesn't bring us into good places, right? It doesn't bring us to a place where we're like, oh, I'm peace, I'm love. And, you know, it kind of gets you ramped up inside. So I believe that this topic of how we actually love and accept people by loving them is pretty important with what we're dealing with right now, especially with those that are living right next to us, lovingly accepting them. So I can already feel the struggle you're probably going with, but yeah, are we just supposed to accept everything? Aren't we supposed to? Well, let's look at some scripture here. The first scripture is this, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Peter says this. He says, above all, love each other Deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. You hear that first part? It says, above all, above all the other requirements, above all the other things that I'm saying, above all else that you're thinking, acting, and doing, above all, what? Love each other deeply. Right? This could have been the verse for our whole series. Love each other deeply. Above all the toilet paper they're using, love them deeply. Above all the ways that they can or can't cook, love them deeply. Above all the ways that they talk or you talk and you don't realize you're talking so much, love each other deeply. But how often do we fall into the idea of judging? So here's the question we want to, we want to launch with. Are we not to judge at all? Are we called not to judge anybody at all? And I ask that question, I start there, because that's where Jesus starts in verse 1 of chapter 7 in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, just to review for you, we're going through portions of the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus' topical teaching on things that are real important to his heart, important to you as a, as a follower of Jesus, or if you're just checking Jesus out, these things are important to him. And one of the topics is not to judge others is what it's labeled. And here's the first one. It says, Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. This verse is used so often, especially by non-Christians, non-followers of Jesus, but they'll pull this verse out, this one verse, and says, hey, who are you to tell me that anything I'm doing right now is wrong? Because Jesus says, Jesus, you're follow the, the head guy of who you follow. He says, do not judge judge. And so if you don't know the rest of this portion of Scripture or you don't know other parts of Scripture, you might be stifled and say, okay, go ahead. You can go down that road even though I I really believe it's dangerous. (laughs) You can live that lifestyle. You can treat your wife that way. You can speak to your parents that way. I'm not going to judge you. Who am I to judge, right? It's a very libertarian view. Just don't, not bother me. Don't stay away. It's Okay. But context is king. Context is king when you're reading scripture. You have to remember this. Don't take one verse or a couple verses or just a portion. You have to look at the totality of scripture's teaching, of Jesus' teaching, and of the, the writing there. And here's 
verse 5, the, the book ends of our, of our text for today. Jesus jumps all the way down after saying, hey, don't worry about the, the speck of dust in your brother's eye, but you got to worry about the plank that's in yours. He says this, you hypocrite. First do this. Take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Did you catch what Jesus was doing there? He says, if you first take this out of your eye, then you're going to clearly see so that you can do nothing? No. You're going to clearly see so that you can remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, it's an order that Jesus is talking about. It's not that we're not to judge, but the order of it. He says, do not judge or you'll be judged because first of all, you got to deal with yourself. Then you can quote-unquote judge or help your brother get on the right path. See, context is king. Taking it out of context, people are like, oh, we can't judge. Well, well, there is some judging going on. And here's another thing that we had to struggle with. Um, people struggle with, well, am I only t- to, uh, to not judge but reprimand? Am I, am I only supposed to, to worry about people that are inside the church as opposed to outside the church? I've had people say this. Well, you know, we can worry about those who are in the church, but everybody outside the church, just let them go hog wild. Now, just saying that doesn't sound right, but people, they'll say that. Well, here's some verses that deal with that. And I'm going to give you two sentences that are opposites, but they agree. Don't you love that? We are teachers who do stuff like that. These sentences are opposites, but they're both true. Like paradoxical, right? Here you go. There is a difference between those inside the church and outside the church. There is a difference between those inside the church and those outside the church. And here's scripture on this. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says this. He says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Now remember, we've got to look at the totality of scripture. So we take part of it and say, okay, um, Paul is encouraging right now at the church in Corinth and maybe in our you know, places you live, it's important to just start at the, at the small stuff, the people inside your family. Inside your church, like, I I have enough to deal with right now. So the business I have right now is just dealing with this. Okay, so that's that's true. So there's a difference. He made a distinction between those inside the church, outside the church. But let me give you this next sentence. There's no difference between those inside the church and outside the church. Some of y'all are like, I'm turning this guy off. He's crazy. Stay with me on this. Stay with me, okay? There is no difference, and here's how. In Romans, another book in the New Testament, chapter 3, Paul, the same one who wrote 2 Corinthians, the same guy, same guy, same mouth, same mind, same spirit, same heart, he wrote this. He says, for all, and in the Greek, guess what? In the Greek, all means all. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not just those inside the church, not outside, not not different nations, not different. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory, basically of God's best, of God's design, of how God would say, this is the best for you. All. So I don't know about you, but I would take that to understand that everyone needs to wake up and realize there are things that are wrong. There are things that are right. And if we want to call it judging, call it whatever you want, but there's things that we need to be aware of that we need to stop doing or start doing inside or outside the church because God is calling us to something different and something better. And sometimes we have to make those those hard calls and we see it as judging, but it's a loving hard call. (sighs) Whew, this is a lot so far. Are you ready for the loving accept part? Okay, here's the judging part. Now we're going to go to, it's not really the antithesis, the opposite of it, but it kind of, it, it is very different, okay? So the judging part leads to what's called loving acceptance. And there's a process, if you look on your outlines, there's a process of lovingly accepting someone, and it begins and continues only with Jesus. You're like, how did I know he was going to say that? Because everything starts and ends with Jesus. But this is really a, a really poignant one right here. The idea that if you want to lovingly accept others, 
the only way to truly do that without building up resentments, without all these other baggage, is to start with Jesus. And here's why. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says again, he says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. So if God wants to show his love for us, this is what he's done. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It, when we were still sinners, a little bit later he'll say enemies actually of God. When we were totally against God, his judgment on us was this, I'm going to send Jesus. While you are still a sinner, I'm going to judge you and this is what I judge. I judge that I love you and I'm sending Jesus. And Christ died for you. Christ came so that the junk that you do, the messes that you get yourself into, the fear that you have, the anxiety, the enemies of God, everything that's contrary to how God thinks, believes, and desires, I'm sending Jesus to rescue you because I lovingly accept you. Notice how he lovingly accepts us before we have an opportunity to do anything that's going to please him. This is far out. This is amazing. This is unearthly, different than the way, the way that, that we normally think. So I want to camp on this word accept here for a moment. It's a word dekomai in the Greek, and it's used in a variety of different ways in the New Testament. But to get your arms wrapped around the concept of what it means to accept some, something or somebody in a biblical aspect, there's three different uh, definitions that are used in the New Testament. So we're going to kind of just, just very quickly look at the three of them and kind of get the idea of how you actually accept somebody, okay? How you accept somebody, especially that person you're like, ah, oh, they drive me crazy, okay? How do you accept them? So the biblical idea is first, and this is probably the one you're thinking about, believe or recognize something or someone as valid. So if you accept something, you believe or recognize it as valid. Number two is to actually, instead of accept, they use the word to receive. So you actually take possession of, you, you have it in your presence, a person or a, or a thing, you, you receive it. The third is, is the idea of welcoming, welcoming. Now I think those are key, those are key. Because here's the idea. Do we lovingly accept everything that everybody does? Well, no, when you look in Scripture, not all that is accepted. However, we can accept it in a way of receiving the person and welcoming the person. And that's what Jesus did in that verse I just read. When we were still enemies, when we were still uh, you know, obstinate towards God, he received us. He welcomed us. He accepted us as children into his family. Ephesians chapter 2. We are brought into his family. That's what godly acceptance is. He doesn't accept the sin, the problem, but he accepts and receives the person. Are you following how big this is? Are you following how huge and different than this is from what the world? People usually are only accepted and loved because of what they do or what they don't do. And God is like, you know what? These are my children. All those presidents up there, whether they're Republican, Democrat, Missionary Antioch, Baptist Church of the Brethren, whatever they are, they're my children. So how can you love them? It begins with Jesus. And so here's an approach, a process that Jesus has. The first one is this. We aim at these three truths. The first one, lovingly accept, or loving acceptance starts at home. Loving acceptance starts at home. And what do we mean by this? Matthew chapter 7, verse 5 again. Remember that Jesus says, hey, if you actually want to be a part of like, you know, helping your brother take the speck out, the judging idea, loving them, receiving them in, how that works is, first of all, you got to take care of your own inventory. You got to get what's wrong with you out first. And here's the idea. Have you ever heard that phrase that you can't give what you don't have? If you haven't taken care of business with yourself and God, and you haven't allowed God to just kind of judge your insides and say, you know what, God, I, I agree with you. This is a bad part of my life. This habit has to stop. You need to take care of it. You need to get it out of here. And then if you haven't allowed Jesus to take that and then God to fill you with his love, you are stuck in a place of self-pity. You are stuck in a place of, uh, of self-doubt and really hating yourself. Some of you are there right now. Some of you have been there with the idea that I'm worthless. 
I'm nothing, especially to God. And scripture tells us otherwise. So you start with yourself, allow yourself to be healed by the only one that can heal, that's Jesus. Allow yourself to look in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm loved. I'm accepted by the creator of the universe, my creator. He loves me, he accepts me. I'm starting at home and then I'll be healthy enough to move forward. And the next thing you're going to see is this, number two, the ultimate judgment and the one who accepts, that's Jesus. Look at this verse. In John chapter 5, moreover, it says, The Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. I find this verse interesting. Because there's going to be a day that Jesus comes back, and the Father's not going to be the one you know, that's judging. It's going to be the Son. And what is Jesus going to do on that last day when you are standing there, the gates of heaven? What's he going to do? He's going to say, you know what? This guy, this gal, have, they have messed up. But I'm stepping in. I'm stepping in front. And look at them. The blood of my blood, the blood of Jesus is flowing on them. They are forgiven. I lovingly accept them. They're coming into our heaven. They're in the family. Right? The judgment is left to Jesus. This should give you great peace. Because the job of being judged is already taken. I, I've often told you there's a huge difference between me and God. And here's the difference. He never con got confused in thinking that he was me. Because sometimes I get confused and think, that's my role, God. I'm going to judge. I'm going to take him down. They're going to they're gonna bow under my thumb. I'm going to tell them how it is. And he's like, no, 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 that's my job. You just laid the truth out. And that's the, the third point right here. Love people with the truth, with hard conversations, and possibly interventions. Love people with the truth, hard conversations, and possibly interventions. Here's the verse for that, Ephesians 4. Instead, Paul says again, speak the truth in love. We will grow to become in every aspect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Some of us will take on that judging role and we'll speak the truth and it's not in love. It's harsh. That's just called being a jerk. But God says, hey, pray about this. Speak the truth in love. You don't shy away. You don't say, well, what you're doing is fine. The, the, the house is on fire upstairs, but I'm not going to tell you that. Have a good day. I'm going to leave. No. You let them know the truth. And sometimes it takes a hard conversation. Sometimes it takes an intervention of a group of you saying, you know what, my, my friend has suffered enough. It's time for me to, to quote unquote judge, but to give them the truth and say, hey, there's something better. We lovingly accept you. We want the behavior to stop. God wants the behavior to stop, but we love, love you. So the wrestling question today, especially with all these people around you, if you're by yourself and you're watching all the TV all the time, all the news is this, is where is Jesus calling you to show loving acceptance? I'll tell you where I'm starting with my dog. You know, when you're home, you got, you know, a couple people you're living with, at least me, and then I got a dog, and that's about it. So I let the dog out, and my wife uh, she, she pointed something out to me a couple days ago. She's like, we throw these orange little tennis balls out in the yard. She brings them back. So we're throwing them out there. And this little dog <laughs> runs out there, passes it up, comes back. And before she puts it in her mouth, she'll bend right like this. And about two inches from it, she'll pee. And then she turns around and puts her mouth on the ball. <laughs> like, so I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I tried it yesterday. Same thing happened. And I'm sitting there judging this dog. I'm like, you are sick. You are nasty, gross. Okay, but they're a dog, right? I'm, this is my year and a half in. I'm still getting used to these little creatures, right? So for me, it may be funny, but it's so true. You got to start somewhere. I'm going to try to love my dog this week and accept my dog for being a dog. Because <laughs> that's how God made dogs. They do other things that gross me out, but I can't talk about that on stage. So anyway, loving my dog. Now, what else? Where do you go from there? Maybe you love your pets, your animals. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're not ready for those that are house right now, but maybe you get someone that doesn't live with you, but they just rub you the wrong way. You're like, you know what? How can I lovingly accept them? It only starts with Jesus. And then finally, those in your house. They're going to do things that are not like you. 
They always say you spot it, you got it. That means if something bothers you, usually you're doing the same thing. But Lord, help me. Help me to love those at work, love those at home, love those around me, love society that so badly needs it right now so that we can live like you and bring you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.